Hi everybody, thank you all for joining us. I hope all of you are in good health. I know that life is completely on an unanticipated bumpy ride right now, but I'm glad that it has not derailed us altogether. Uh, so here we are waiting to listen to someone beyond amazing, as one of his former students mentions, Professor Sudhakar Salman Raj. Uh, Sudhakar sir has been teaching in Wilson College for about four decades now. He's also an ardent nature lover. Uh, he has received the Green Teacher Award from Sanctuary Asia in 2010. He is also author of the book Living Nature, published in 2019. The things he has done for his students and nature are endless, and so is our admiration for him. Uh, now, I request all of you to please keep yourselves on mute so that there is no disturbance during the session. If you have any questions, put them on the chat box. The session will have two parts. After the first and after the second part, there'll be a small window for Q&A. All your questions will be addressed then from the chat. And that time, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, so I request your kind cooperation. I now hand it over to Sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, good evening to uh, every one of you. Uh, I hope I'm clear. Uh, I thank. Uh, Abhishek, Suvasini, Naushin, Anmol, and uh, whoever else has been involved in uh, putting this together. The topics have come from uh, quite a few people who have been discussing over the past uh, few days uh, to see what would be relevant. So uh, this is something which has come on the basis of request. And as we go on uh, through this week, if any of you feel that there should be other topics which should be taken up or issues which should be discussed, please let us know. I will see where we can uh, kind of add it in. Uh, today's session, uh, if you look at the topic, uh, it talks about uh, how to be composed uh, in times of distraction. Uh, so before I come to uh, what is it that can help us be composed, uh, I would want all of us to uh, go a little back, or fight back in history. I want to start with uh, some of you, or quite a few, are political science students. Uh, what did uh, Aristotle say uh, would be the characteristics of a citizen? Uh, I want you to think. Aristotle had two characteristics uh, which he said would define a citizen. And uh, I want you to just, whatever comes to mind, just write it down. We'll not share it, but we will look at it. We'll see in terms of whether his definition and your definition. A match because I want to take that first uh, when we uh, talk about uh, the current context. Uh, for Aristotle, there were two uh, qualities required. First is the capacity to rule. Now, what is the capacity to rule? The capacity to rule is uh, an understanding of uh, public affairs, the understanding of the world around us and the ability to come with solutions which would provide stability and whatever else. Now, that is something which I think is very Hello, important. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that I think is a very important thing for all of us here to think about. Because when you say that we are a democracy, uh, it implies that uh, we are in some way uh, participating in the uh, process of decision making. So what is our own understanding and contribution to this. So what I would like, again, individuals to do is, if you're a part of public policy decision making, what would the kind of things you would have done differently? Before that, what is our understanding of issues? We're talking about uh, the larger number of uh, destitute poor on the uh, streets, trying to get back to a more uh, uh, supportive place, or we're looking at in terms of um, uh, a lot of people uh, who've lost livelihoods, a lot of people uh, whose income has dropped drastically, and a lot of other things. So if you're a policymaker, what is it that you would really think we should be doing? So that's something which I want us to think about. Because it's very easy for all of us to be critical, Honor. because it's necessary for us to be critical. But being critical uh, is one part, because then we are uh, also, in terms of uh, being critical from a position of understanding of constraints, issues, 
So that is something which I think I want you to look at. That's the first thing in terms of the capacity to rule. So what is it that, what kind of thinking, what kind of sensibilities, uh, what kind of inclusiveness, uh, what are the kind of things which we should train ourselves to be as citizens. I'm not saying that all of us will be a part of uh, civil service or uh, political process, but this mindset where we want to engage with the process. But that's important because uh, sitting back and uh, having an opinion is okay, but do we understand what are the issues? Uh, what is it? Uh, is there anything new we are getting to the table? One of the biggest things, uh, biggest uh, capacity each one of us has is the power of imagination. And uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Western political thought, Plato was the first one uh, who used his imagination to, to suggest a radical new alternative. Mm -hmm. The alternative may have flaws, he may have his own biases, but that's secondary. But are we able to engage our mind to think, to, to look at uh, uh, possibilities? Because that is something which is uh, a very good way to channelize energy, to, to energize thinking process. That's the first part. The second part is the capacity to be ruled. This is something which I think is very, very important. What is the capacity to be ruled? The capacity to be ruled is we are willing to accept the rule of law. What is the rule of law? One law for every one of us. One law without exception. Whether I'm in a position of power, whether I'm in a position of privilege, whether I'm in a uh, situation where I have the necessary contact, am I willing to be uh, subject to the rule of law? This is the most difficult part. I don't know how many of you here uh, drive four wheelers. I'm sure many of you drive two wheelers. Okay. How many of you can honestly say that you never overtake from the left. Okay. There's a rule that we should overtake from the right, and you know, uh, a lot of us we are in a hurry to go and to do things, so we're constantly, you know, breaking these rules. So when we are breaking rules, and are we in a position to talk about corruption and things like that, or are we willing to reflect at what we sh what we as individuals in terms of are doing as citizens in terms of to ensure that the rule of law is applied and needs to start with us. And this is something, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not being self-righteous. I know I, I used to uh, ride a two-wheeler for 10 years in the 1990s. And I'm sure I constantly uh, overtook from the left. I don't know what kind of inconvenience I caused to uh, motorists and other people, but this is a very small example of things which is important. And also, you know, uh, last one week I've been cycling in the morning. And also if somebody honks from, the, from behind, my tendency is move to the left because that's giving space for the other person to move. Uh, yesterday there was a policeman on a bike. He, he, he uh, honked and I moved to the left and I realized that he was overtaking from the left the very little space between me and the pavement. But he is a custodian of law. Maybe I don't know whether he understands the law. And that is something which is a part of us. A lot of us find it very difficult to be ruled. I can say as a teacher in college, whether there's a library or whatever, a lot of us, I mean, especially including me, we thrive on exceptionalism. And this is something which we need to understand and question. Are we somebody who's, who are, who's really willing to be subject to the rule of law? Because as citizens, if we expect people to obey the rule of law, if you expect our rulers to obey the rule of law, are we also doing? And because we're doing, we also have a moral right to demand that everybody else, uh, else also obeys the rule of law. And do we make it a part of public discourse, this whole question of you know, uh, ensuring that there is a rule of law? One of the biggest problems in our country is we find exceptions not to obey the rule of law. Okay. Now, Many years ago, there was a, a philosophy professor in Wilson College. And I remember he said one statement, which a lot of us often misinterpret. And the statement he said was that uh, exceptions prove the rule. If I read it literally, okay, 
uh, it can mean that exceptions, you know, uh, justify rationalized rule. But he said, the word prove comes from the Latin word probare. And probare is in terms of, you know, the, the root is challenge. Any kind of exceptions challenge the validity of rules. And this is where we all need to start. And if we start, we also have, I think, the moral right to insist that everybody else. But we also need to ask ourselves, okay, what are the kind of rules okay, we tend to overlook because it's convenient? I've used traffic rules as an example. I'm sure there are a lot of other rules, okay, uh, whether it is constitutional uh, rules about rights and whatever else, we disregard because it's convenient. We disregard because we are in a position of influence. We disregard because we are in a position of power. And therefore, this is something which I want to start our session with, that in terms of the rule of law is fundamental for societies to function well. And what's the premise behind the rule of law? That law is defined by reason. If law is defined by reason, we must also question laws which don't adhere to this reason. But breaking the law is not a solution. So how do you create a critical mass which also says that these laws don't make sense, that these laws need to modify? Uh, I just finished uh, reading this book called um, Invisible Women by uh, Carolyn Sanchez. And my premise, my suggestion is that every one of you must read this book, uh, Invisible Women. It talks about how women don't, uh, uh, are not included in a lot of understanding of what is necessary. A lot of data of what is the best way to do it is something which, you know, uh, has not really taken women into consideration. Women have not been a part of data collection. Women, women whether it's women's health or design of automobiles, or everything, uh, the, the default position is male, whether it's... Uh, male body mass, the male metabolism, uh, male concerns. That's very interesting that, you know, whenever there is, uh, uh, there is a, a cyclone or there is an uh, earthquake or whenever, and then people build homes, very few women are part of the decision making in, in designing homes. So what happens is a lot of homes don't have kitchens. Because women, men are not somebody who are, uh, whose mind is designed to think about these things. They're only looking at functional places uh, which matter to them and not about other places which are very important. So therefore, when we are talking about uh, the rule of law, okay, the first thing is to, is to start questioning our own biases and assumptions. I need to read more, I need to uh, discuss more, I need to uh, challenge a lot of my own assumptions. And that's very important. I must thank uh, two of my uh, former students who made this book. I mean, the first person who mentioned it to me was Achna Shetty, and then uh, Shilpa Rao was in 2007. But she actually sent the book to me. And I never enjoyed a book more than this because the book has so much of research. Every chapter is crammed with research. So when we are thinking about uh, making laws, finding solutions, are we really including everybody? This is something, how broad was our understanding of people are different from us. Whether it's tribal communities, whether it is extremely poor people, uh, and various other kinds of sections of people. You know, uh, when uh, uh, the lockdown happened, I, one of the concerns I've been thinking of, what happens to a lot of people who depend on daily wage, whether it's cab drivers or whether people uh, who are hawkers for three months as the business is, is being shut what happens to the survival doesn't matter where they come from so these are things which we need to ask are we really thinking about them and what kind of solutions can we have which, uh, which is balanced which is nuanced uh, which looks at both safety, well-being as well as a concern for some of these issues so this is something which I think I want all of us uh, to start with. This is the first thing in terms of are we capable of uh, ruling in terms of providing meaningful inputs for decision making. Okay. 
uh, thought through decision. When we say public opinion, is it informed opinion? Okay, is it based on data? Is it based on research? Is it based on experience? Okay, because a lot of times, you know, when, uh, when, when we are talking about people who need, a lot of them food is, I mean, we provide them grains. What about fuel? What about oil? What about water? What about a uh, lot of other hygiene requirements? So a lot of times when we are, you know, this I, we have learned through experience uh, in a lot. We made a lot of mistakes. I remember when we first were um, helping people who were affected by tsunami in, uh, in 2004, 5. We realized we are making so many mistakes. But we may still be making mistakes unless we start being open and find out where the data gaps are. Okay? That's one part of what I want to say first uh, is to look at uh, how we can be better uh, contributors to the idea of, of rulers, of ruling, and how can we be also uh, be constantly training ourselves uh, to be ruled. That's one part of what I want to say. The second part of what I want to say is in terms of what is the meaning of the word reflection? Okay. A lot of times when I'm thinking about what's happening around me, very often I'm overwhelmed. Okay. Uh, I am pessimistic. I, am, uh, I feel uh, helpless. Reflection is the ability to look at ideas, facts, and find responses which may be helpful. Sometimes, when we hold too strongly to one set of ideas, our reflection may be only pessimistic. Let me give an example. Uh, when Aristotle was alive, uh, Philip of Macedonia decided uh, to uh, attack Athens and include it in his uh, empire. It meant the end of a way of life. In Athens, all men were part of the decision-making process at varying levels. Women were not included. But everybody was involved in political process. And suddenly, with being a part of the Macedonian Empire, they became uh, atomized. They became individuals with no identity. They, didn't know, uh, they had no personal understanding of the Philip or his son or whatever. So there was a lot of pessimism. And if you look at some of the philosophies which came at that time, Stoicism, Epicureanism, both of them were based on the belief that things will never get better. Okay, so we need to adjust, we need to accept or whatever else. True reflection must also be based on what I call optimism. The belief that we all can effect change. Our imagination is powerful enough to imagine new realities. Yes, we need to collaborate, we need to be open. But this reflection is something which I want to look at. Because sometimes when we say we're thinking, a lot of times we may be just brooding. What is brooding going over the same thing again and again? Okay. Okay. We may just be finding fault, we may be just be placing blame, whatever else. But does it really help us move forward? So the, the need to look for solutions is something which we need to look at. Maybe a lot of us have not been trained to do that. It will take a lot of effort. It will take um, a lot of really, in terms of working with people, conversations. For me, uh, very often, a lot of us are not having conversations. We're not listening to each other. We're not listening to contrary opinions. To see if we can see the way we think. Because a lot of energy comes when our imagination is activated. And to look at possible positive solution, I need to remain positive. I need to look at solution. I need to look to believe that all of us can create the kind of reality which we imagine and we want to uh, happen. That's one, the uh, first part of it. The second is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the work of uh, uh, Victor uh, Frankl. I'm sure some of you have read his book. And he talks about uh, you know, he talks about people uh, who are able to have strength and survive emotionally, mentally, and physically. When they were looking, when they had something to believe in, when they had something to look forward to. So this whole concept of logotherapy 
it's the belief that all of us will come to positively out of this. And therefore we need to engage with that, with that understanding. Because this is important, because a lot of times the uh, negativity, the violence, the brutality, the insensitivity can overwhelm us. Okay? Often it happens to me sometimes when we're sitting and for, for some time, for an hour, I don't feel like getting up because I'm feeling that maybe when will this all end? So this, the need to constantly reinforce that all of us can effect positive change is important. The other thinker who, for me, uh, is very important in this context in multiple ways is this uh, thinker which a lot of political science students studying in Mumbai University may not be familiar with. Okay? Uh, she's possibly one of the most well-known uh, women political philosophers of the 20th century. Okay. Hannah Arendt, H-A-N-N-A-H, A-R-E-N-D-T. Now, Hannah Arendt uh, is known for a very influential book on the origins of totalitarianism. And she's familiar with totalitarianism of uh, uh, Stalin and the totalitarianism of Hitler. And uh, a lot of people she knew were victims of both kinds of totalitarianism. Uh, she also uh, wrote a book called The Human Condition. And in The Human Condition, she's going back to uh, both Plato and Aristotle uh, to look at uh, in terms of uh, um, the contemplative side and the active side. Action is where we decide to do changes, uh, work on things which can uh, make life better. And one of the things she believes is that the quest for freedom, choice, all of that's very important. And the contemplative thing sometimes can also paralyze us. So how do you balance both of them? Okay, so that is something which is important. And also, uh, Hannah Arendt is important because she also looked at the idea of love uh, in the works of Augustine. Okay, some of you may be familiar with the medieval political thinker. Okay, in terms of how does it in terms of affect uh, public life and all of that, maybe that is something which we can also explore. But a very important work which is also extremely controversial. Her uh, uh, report on the Eichmann trials uh, in Jerusalem okay, uh, for war crimes. And uh, she talked about this whole thing about the banality of evil. Uh, a lot of historian of ideas have questioned, they said there are some people who are pathologically, who are sociopaths, and they enjoy visiting pain in other people. But her premise was that people like Eichmann and a lot of people believed that they were just doing their job. They were not naturally evil. But they were so conditioned, or they thought that they'll progress if they followed orders, so where they abdicated the human imagination to think of different realities. And that's something which I want us to think about. That I talked about this whole human imagination because a lot of times, as students, we are just a part of the system where we are also following what has been done before. Are we engaging with our teachers? Are we engaging with our organizations? to create different realities. Maybe, the, of course, there'll be resistance. But have we thought through so the use of our imagination? Because a lot of times, many of us, not just bureaucrats, many of us, in many ways, are continuing the status quo. So please uh, activate your imagination also for the public sphere, for political affairs, for things which uh, affect every one of us. So this is uh, something which I think is important for us. Maybe do read uh, this thing about uh, how does one really become citizens. And each one of us is not just citizenship is not voting once in five years. Okay. Citizenship is engaged. Now, what is it that I can do now? Are we can I write to my corporator, to my uh, MLA, to lots of people, to bureaucrats, about what I think could be done as suggestions, as ideas, as possibilities? A lot of us here have possibly contributed uh, to helping people 
uh, who have lost livelihoods. So our way of contributing is ensuring food reaches them and whatever else. What happens to livelihoods? How do they depend? I mean, see, now if we are talking, not, we are talking about very poor, but we, are, but we also need to look at the middle class. A lot of middle class who work for the private sector, unorganized, have not got salary. They've not been dismissed, but they've not got salaries. Some of them have got 50% cuts. Are there solutions for such people? What are the ways in which we can help people okay, who are deprived of livelihoods? Okay. So that's something which I don't know whether I mean I personally don't have a solution. But I'm sure our collective imagination will have a lot of interesting solutions. So please, as individuals, empower yourself to think. In the beginning is difficult. We may get stuck, we may feel that we don't know enough. Find out. As all of us, uh, you know, uh, for everything we need, there are lots of things. So even, I mean, many of you don't need my lecture about how to be composed in times of distraction. You Google and you'll find uh, at least 10 different uh, people saying things of what you can do to stay composed. But if you can use your reflective mind to find solution, that would be helpful. Okay. So this comes to the end of my first part of what I want to say about understanding the rule of law. How uh, do we have the capacity to rule? We have the capacity to rule. And how do we uh, uh, ensure that uh, we use uh, we use our uh, uh, reflective consciousness? Because that's something which is there. Uh, so I will look at uh, questions for some time. I'll ask to ask me now at the moment to read our questions one by one. I'll let me take a few. Then we'll open it to the floor. Some of you may be more comfortable asking questions. We'll do both. But I think first we'll start with the uh, uh, questions which uh, may be in the chat box. Uh, so ask me, are there any questions yeah. in the chat box? Uh, so as of now, there are no questions on the chat box. So if anybody wants to ask questions, please unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, please do that. Please unmute your mic and ask. Uh, if nobody is going to ask, uh, may yeah. I go ahead? This is Abhishek. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so my question had to do with uh, what the, in the beginning of your talk you talked about uh, who is a citizen, according to Aristotle, yeah. and you defined him in terms of a person who is willing to engage in the democratic process. In, in, no, engage in decision making. Okay, sorry. Uh, continue the question. Yeah. In the decision process. So. Uh, I wanted to ask in the present context in, uh, in today's day and age when there is so much information to uh, get like from news from from the newspaper from mass media things like that there's so much that it is almost uh, impossible for one individual to know enough about any topic to actually engage in the process so it's a problem of um, too many options I believe so how do you think someone should focus their um, their um, their passion or their understanding of a subject so that they know enough so that they can participate? Am I clear? I'm sorry. Yeah. So my the first uh, part of my answer is that see, all of us can't find solutions for everything. What is the area of concern? Is the area of concern in terms of uh, uh, livelihoods? Is the area of concern providing people uh, access to uh, materials uh, uh, in a dignified manner? Is area of concern uh, maybe domestic violence? So what are the ways in which we can engage with the community, with the political process, with the cult cultural process? To have conversations to find solutions. It's true that uh, all of us cannot really uh, find solutions yet. But I think this choose one or two which you really concerned about what you, what you think is the most important problem. Now, in terms of when you talk about health, you know, uh, the monsoons are about to start. 
and monsoons come with a range of uh, you know uh, diseases and problems uh, in a lot of our cities uh, because of covid uh, drains have not been fully cleared so the problem of flooding so what kind of community solution so therefore you choose what is it that uh, in your context in your area in your area of interest eat up i mean just uh, look at in terms of what people have said look at the public policy what it has to say on these matters okay uh, look at uh, the solution in different countries what are the countries where they have done uh, better disaster management okay but then southeast asia south asia uh, are there things which we can learn from but the most important thing is our own experience you have lived uh, you have engaged with people and if you know better what is it that you can help and how can you get other people to think about okay, that's the issue yeah any other questions so we have yeah we have some questions on the comment section yeah uh, one question is from rohit patel he asks that are our communication platforms good enough for good communication okay see one is uh when you say communication uh, platforms communication platforms are good enough for people who are privileged what does that mean if i stay in an area which have there's good bandwidth which has no electricity fluctuations and all of that maybe i'll have very good communication so if people don't have access to a lot of the uh, communication tools and of course that's something which we need to look at i I'm, i'm reminded uh, about 6 uh, weeks ago uh, my friend uh, mahmud kadri uh, asked me a question he said that a lot of schools are having online teaching okay but a lot of people uh, who live in the slums and are very poor do not have access to smartphones is there some way in which we can find solutions where we can uh find ways to distribute education material which is interesting and fun which will also engage them in so being able to do streams or but also will engage and that's a i mean there are about 100 of you here can can we think of solutions because it'll take some time before schools will open so what are the kind of things we can do so you asked me whether uh, my uh, practice of using handouts will help i said it may not be economically viable uh it also needs a lot of the way i use handouts is somebody you need an instructor but some of you are creative who like education find out because there is this huge gap in communication that's one part when it's a communication platforms for the privileged yes the existing communication platform have a lot of potential but for those who don't have access for those who have limited access uh especially for the young because uh in very poor families maybe there may be no smartphones or one smartphone for the whole family who will get to use it how will they use it a uh, lot of families may not have uh, uh you know laptops so how will they access how will they learn so that's one the second part of communication which i want to emphasize is a biggest problem with communication we all focus on what we want to say you're not focusing sufficiently on whether it's relevant for people uh in terms of persuading them to our way of thinking if i'm coming up with a solution is a solution relevant to their way of thinking the words the options do you understand concerns fears inhibitions resistance and if i can we find a way to factor that in when i talk instead of preaching can i ask questions can i can a lot of solutions come from questions can I ask questions which can help them find their own solutions that is something because now in terms of when we say healthcare systems are inadequate uh people like nachiket are figuring out in terms of access to healthcare for everybody and there are very interesting solutions where everybody may not need a ventilator maybe just need uh, providing oxygen just in terms of uh, cordoning of areas there are lot of solutions which can work given our constraints and we need to be able to communicate that in a way which they can also relate to which they can also believe in so when you say communication there's two parts yes platforms of privileges 
uh, is good for the not so privileged, not so good. I hope it answers your question. Okay. So shall we take up one more question? Sure. Yeah. So there is uh, one member who wants your comments on uh, that there are thousands of laws in India, and it's said that government rules citizens by guilt for breaking laws. They want your comment on this. No, no. Can you repeat the question? The last part of the question. There are thousands of laws in India, and it's said that government rules citizens by guilt for breaking laws. Okay. Yeah. Let me answer this question. The first part is yes. See, first of all, in terms of there are lots of rules. So, Asani, in the meantime, if you could give us another introduction about Sir. <laughs> uh, I, I introduced him right in the beginning. So, now this is another time for all those latecomers. Till Sir joins us back. Yeah, I, I have got a question. That's why Sir got this Sir? Yes. This is your question, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so, uh, one second, oh God. That's My question is suddenly. that there are laws as old as 1860, which is the yeah. Indian Penal Code, and there are thousands and thousands of laws, mm -hmm. and we are every time guilty of breaking a law. When the policeman catches you, he can book you under any rule of law. So how do we tackle that? Okay, okay. Hope sir comes back soon. Yeah, I'll just Abhishek, are you there? Hold on. All right. Thank you. And so, Asri, for future uh, program, could you have some interlude music so that everybody knows that it is just an interruption and Sir will be back? Yeah, but well, he's back now. Okay. I can see him. But I'll yeah, make sure that happens. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize the connection was. So, I'm just saying that uh, we can always, you know, uh, the point I want to make is. A lot of things which are wrong around us okay, and need to change. But in the kind of context which is now, what is it that we can do uh, to change things? Okay. That's the thing. Yes, uh, the system has to change, the government has to have lesser laws, uh, guilt and coercion is not the best way to get people to uh, follow. All of that is there. Okay. But is there a better way of getting this done? That's my uh, concern. Yeah. Uh, so one question from Parth is, uh, uh, statistics can be manipulated and opinions can be biased. How does one know if what they know is true or accurate? How does one filter the information available to them? Okay, one is, see, the, by the, uh, the first part of my answer is that in terms of A, if you uh, apply your own skeptical thinking, what is skeptical thinking? We question all facts. Okay. Uh, are the facts exaggerated? What is it that's missing? Also, what are the sources which you are using to cross-check? Okay. So, am I looking at uh, 
different sources, sources which are critical of my position, sources which are supportive of my position. That's something which is uh, important for us to for us to really develop. You know, I'll just digress a little. Uh, how many of you here are familiar with somebody called Bjorn Lomborg, B J uh, O R N L O M B O R G? Very few people, I'm sure. Will be. But after the session, uh, look him up. You know, his uh, first book is a book called Skeptical Environmentalist, which said that uh, climate change is not happening a lot of it. Then, 2009, he came out with a book called Cool It. Uh, which he said there are other things which are priority. And they were, he viciously attacked things like the Stern Report and a lot of other things. The guy is very good, he's very articulate, he has got very good data. If you look at his latest book, he's agreeing that solutions, he has different kinds of solutions. So when I read that book, I also looked at how much of the facts agreed with facts on the ground or what he's saying. So therefore, because I travel, I was able to find out that a lot of what he said were not really supported by facts on the field. So when I said use the imagination, use your imagination. I'm not saying, see, uh, newspapers, there are, there are a lot of um, authors, scholars, uh, institutions. Look at different things. For different subjects, I'm sure there are lots of uh, this. Talk to different people. You know, if you have a broader circle, of uh, friends and acquaintances, talk to them. I'm sure they'll have access to sources which you've not thought about. As I said, this book, Invisible Women, I was not even aware of it. My former students said that I should read, and I'm so enriched and I'm so glad that I got to read a book like that. So, a lot of the books I read sometimes are suggested by students, by friends, uh, conversations. So, therefore, we will need to find ways in which. We expand our uh, knowledge, our circle of understanding. And our, we need to have uh, people who are different from us. We need to have sources which are different from us. And then use your judgment. Sometimes we can be wrong, sometimes we can be right. But just constantly question, question assumptions, question whether something's working or not. I think that's the best way to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so there are about five more questions. So, yeah, we can take questions and I'll move on. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, so one is by uh, Ms. Swamini. She's, uh, uh, she's saying that in Delhi, the Institute of uh, National Environment Engineering Research Institute, it takes care of the waste management and rivers. Uh, they have been successful in converting the effluent flow turned to appear a garden from top. And underground is the waste treatment plant. And if we want our Maharashtra government to approach this institute, for Mithi River, which is no long, how one should go about it? See, one is, see, when you talk about Mithi and other places, that, see, one is this, uh, a lot of solutions like root zone cleaning system. If those of you who are from Pune or go to Pune, uh, go to the uh, Osho Park, where they've done, where they've converted Nala water into water, which can water the plants using various kinds of plants. Uh, it's not just the Maharashtra government. So also look at the municipal corporation in terms of, again, as I said, how is it a matter of priority? What are the kind of things? Uh, also, if you look at the meeting, they were on both sides. A lot of these small, small units. Okay. Uh, so we need to find solutions to that as well. How do you reduce the constant inflow? Okay. What are the kind of things we can do? Or what are the alternatives? All of that um, is something which we have to explore. Okay, uh, the uh, Niri is one institute which has solutions, but I'm sure there are lots of other solutions. But for a government uh, uh, to take action, there must be a critical mass of people who suggest that why don't we do anything about it? And Miti River will definitely more than the Maharashtra government will look at the municipal. We should look at municipal corporation, uh, the wards around that place. Uh, what are the different ways in which we can push the government towards doing something? I'll read out the next question, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next one's by Vrishti. She's asking, as manners are taught as we grow up, should parenting also involve the idea of exposing their children uh, to the idea of giving back to the society and unbiased critical thinking? 
I think this is uh, extremely important. You know, in certain uh, religious cultures, uh, charity is mandated. A uh, certain part of income you will have to really uh, uh, ensure that you do that. So that is one way of doing. But when you say uh, unbiased thinking is that it's not just parents because even in schools, a lot of us are not exposed to critical thinking. Maybe it's also because parents and teachers are insecure, they don't know enough, or they see sometimes questions as an affront uh, to their authority or challenge. So this whole culture of learning, which does not allow for uh, critical thinking and critical questioning. So therefore, yes, it's important that uh, uh, we allow um, uh, or we start building cultures where questions are encouraged. That's one part. Uh, second, I, uh, I, have a I have a former colleague, uh, Mrs. Nina Heinz, she was a Jew, and once she said, uh, that this I've shared in some of my classes. She said uh, that the writer of Ten Commandments must have been a parent. Okay. Uh, because one of the commandments says that should uh, respect your parents. And she says, it's nowhere does it say that parents should respect children. So if you can have a system where you know, everybody is respected as a human being, and therefore, uh, when maybe when a person is young enough to think for himself or herself, uh, that process of thinking is encouraged because that's something which is important asking questions curiosity skeptical thinking is good giving back to the society is definitely very 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 important the problem is a lot of times uh, a lot of our uh, uh, education etc emphasize too much on success uh, getting into the best colleges best courses uh, getting good salaries there's very little uh, emphasis on even in our normal education system of giving back and uh, maybe uh, a lot of people uh, don't have role models to look up to. So I don't know if, uh, um, as a teacher, uh, how many of us will real role models for young people uh, to think about society, to give back to society? So young people also need a lot more role models. But yes, giving back to society, uh, critical thinking, skeptical thinking, extremely important, more important than anything else. Yeah, the next question is from Zubin. He's asking, uh, you mentioned about Eichmann just doing his job, which is mentioned by Hannah Aaron. Doesn't the factor of rational thinking come here if he is such an important bureaucrat before he could commit such war crimes? Yeah, see, that's why I'm saying, see, there are critics of uh, Hannah Aaron to point out that some of the brutalities which uh, uh, Eichmann did was something which uh, was not that unthinkingly carried out. He used his own interpretation to... Uh, do a lot of brutality. But what I'm saying is that a lot of people sometimes uh, are part of the system and they believe they are uh, just doing their job. Okay. Like if you look at in terms of, you know, like, uh, you know, when I was growing up uh, in school, corporal punishment was common. Okay. All of us, uh, every one of my class, we all have got pasted by our teachers. It is normal to beat up children. So now it has changed because thinking has changed. Okay. But teachers were not really in that sense, maybe uh, say this. Hey, people also say, you know, that I'm sure uh, some of the older generation will remember this proverb, no? Okay. Spare the rod and spoil the child. So this kind of thinking can is is a problem. I'm saying is I'm not I'm not condoning Eichmann and, and I'm sure even uh, Hannah Arendt was not condoning. What she was saying is to stop looking at something as just being evil. But a lot of people thought they were doing something to uphold because, you see, a lot of times we, we stop questioning um, our religion, uh, our country, our institution. Okay. And we do what they tell us. Okay. Whether it's in the best interest or not, we've not thought. So, as ra so when you say rationality, there is something called... Uh, the rationality itself is bounded by our assumptions and rules and uh, shoulds. Okay. So there's nothing like objective rationality. Okay. So rationality is depend on how we think. It includes, it's based on our biases, our thinking. So rationality itself needs to be subject to uh, 
to questions. Uh, to, does it make sense? Why are we doing this? Okay. Uh, so the next one is uh, not exactly a question. Tushar sir says that most or all of today's laws were designed by British. We have been only amending it. We have now to develop laws which suit our current and future needs. See, this is partly true because when you look at uh, criminal procedure code, a lot of that, it, uh, forest laws, etc., we've inherited and we modified. But if you look at the constitutional framework, a lot of thinking went into it. And I think we should not uh, look at a constitution just cut and paste, which a lot of people today are saying. The constitution had, you know, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the papers of the constitutional assembly, there were more than six, seven thousand questions which were raised. A lot of things were debated. Some of them were uh, removed. Some of them were kept. Uh, and yes, we need to change that. Some of them were kept because we need to, uh, to control and whatever else. There are a lot of new laws which have come in. Because if you look at uh, a lot of us, uh, welfare schemes, if you look at director, if you look at all the things that have come from uh, direct opinion of state policy, none of them existed during uh, British times. Okay. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, 73rd and 74th local self government, uh, if you look at NREG, there are so many laws, so many things which have come. Okay. As, or even if you look at something like MRTP, Monopolies and Restricted Trade Practice Prevention Act, it had a certain kind of rationale at that time. Still, it is very uh, convenient for all of us to bash uh, the socialist model and say it didn't work, it had its flaws. But if you look at uh, the, you should look at a letter written by the Bombay Club. These were some of the topmost industrialists, the Birlas, the Bajars, Tatas and all of them. They said, we don't have the capacity to invest in core sector industry, basic sector, infrastructure, uh, that the government should. They actually want the public sector. Yeah. So maybe we need to ask at what point of time public sector should have been limited, not allowed to expand the way it did. A lot of these questions are there. Better regulation. So to say that everything we have has come from the British, I don't think is based on correct premises. Because you can examine a lot of sets of laws which have come post-independence. And much later, uh, so a lot of them have come. I think that we need to look at. Yeah. Okay, the next one is from uh, Shweta. Uh, yeah. She says, you, you already mentioned about how many people are sitting on 50% pay cuts and some have not got their salary at all. At a rational level, it is right thing from the management side, but it's very exploitative. So how do we deal with this during an economic slowdown? Okay, see, one is in terms of, uh, see, if you look at organizations, uh, if I look at myself as a teacher, uh, we have a lot of, what I said, safety nets. The people who have suffered most are the uh, unorganized sector. And in India, it's 90% is unorganized. And in the unorganized sector, yes, but we also didn't have any plan for anybody to provide for safety nets. So if people have safety nets, this kind of destitution would not have happened. So we have been dismantling a lot of safety nets uh, whenever there's a crisis. Now, if you look at uh, uh, places like UP, uh, Rajasthan, in quite a few states, they are suspending all labor laws for the next three to five years. Why should the burden fall on the poor? Uh, so there's a lot of uh, issues which we need to examine much more closely. Yes, it is a lot of small employers don't have the capacity uh, if they're not able to sell. So there, it is a serious problem. So should, shouldn't the government and other people have stepped in uh, to provide sustenance, to provide relief? This is something which we need to ask because if you look at uh, many countries, a lot of the governments have provided a lot of uh, uh, lockdown assistance in terms of actual economic assistance. That's something which has not happened. Yeah. Okay. So Any should other? we continue taking up questions? There are quite I a few. We should, no, because I think it's uh, better because then we can... Uh, I will look at some of these, uh, the comfort part a little bit. Uh, when I'm looking at mental health, I'll also look at that. So we can take up questions. Okay. 
so amma is asking why india is still in a state of war with poverty uh there are many uh, answers one may be uh, over a period of time uh, we not really paid attention enough attention to rural areas uh, so there's a lot of uh, if you look at agriculture distress there's been severe agriculture distress now for really 30 years and we not addressed it so because of the agriculture distress the number of people have come into cities uh, uh, to work to seek work all of that has improved so uh one is we are looking also at solutions which uh, often um, we take from other people we not really looked at what works best for us i'm sure all of you in school have studied green revolution okay. if you look at green revolution in terms of that one needs to talk about green revolutions green revolution lot a lot need a lot of inputs of uh, fertilizer mechanization all of that and uh, somebody like ms swaminathan has won a lot of awards uh, for uh, facilitating green revolution i have a problem with ms swaminathan because he looked at uh, hybrid varieties which are mexican others in india if you look at the biodiversity of rice or wheat uh, it is huge why didn't you look for hybrids from local varieties in a lot of places many of them are very productive because a lot of times it's easier for us to choose solutions which come from outside we're not listening to our people we're not listening to uh traditional knowledge There are a lot of things so therefore the war against poverty is because sectors are getting neglected inequality has not been addressed properly and of course policies which have not been effective uh, regulation which has not been effective there are multiple reasons so there's no one reason and some of you may have may be familiar with more details okay. Tejas Jain, please yeah. mute yourself. Tejas Jain, mute yourself. What's the name of the meeting? Yeah. 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 Can you ask a question, please? Yeah. Yes. Uh, next one's with uh, from Daniel. Uh, his question is with respect to the argument regarding communication platforms and its availability to the masses. uh he says i would like to know your view on the alleged alleged suicide of a 14 year old dalit girl in kerala by the name of devika as per reports she chose to take her life as she could not get access to a laptop for online classes uh, i would like to know who failed her the government the education system us as a society or her caste itself uh again see this is a very uh, complex question and the question is very very important uh why is it important because uh we are creating aspirations in our schools and uh thing where the emphasis is so much on technology so therefore we are actually shifting away from uh, normal modes of teaching which are more egalitarian to more technology based teaching we are not really paying attention to the content of technology based teaching we are just saying technology based teaching is better okay uh so in terms of what are the kind of pressures the, uh, the child faces in school uh, for not having her own laptop you know this whole comparison this whole uh, humiliation all of that is something which will be there and uh, yes being uh, dalit is uh, many times disadvantaged but i'm saying it is our entire approach when we say modernization we are just embracing uh technology we are questioning whether it is the best way to have it now everybody you see even now in terms of all of us are saying from we uh, online teaching is best but we need to find ways in which we need to connect to people because we are all social beings and that is something we need to find within this uh pandemic are there better solutions in which we can with uh, we can have better ways of connecting uh, as human beings rather than just to uh, machines so who failed everybody has failed in the sense that because all of us were also just promoting one set of solutions i also want to just shift a little you know from 1991 uh we we have decided that we'll do away with uh, uh certain aspects of socialism and we decided to call it economic reforms okay are we really saying that is it proven 
that only capitalist forms of uh, economic policy is uh, progressive and uh, the best. You're not. So the, we all use words without questioning. We're not looking at, as I said, safety nets. We're not looking at uh, sufficient amount of regulation. So who's failed, Devika? A lot of us. And also the fact that I'm glad Daniel asked the question about Devika because many of us here are not even familiar with Devika. I'm sure there may be many such people uh, who may not have taken the extreme step yet, but also suffering a lot of uh, reduced self-esteem, mental stress, mental health issues, because they feel inadequate, because they don't have what everybody else thinks is normal. Yeah. Next question from Payushi. Uh, yeah. Due to this lag lockdown situation, the number of students going through depression and loneliness has increased because of the online mode of education. How do we bridge this gap? So the first question, that's what we come back to where we started. Today's topic about how do you remain composed? One is, do we really understand uh, what's happening because of this. One is how much we really understand continued uncertainty, what it can do to us. Because even in uh, the army, they said that if people don't have a clear idea of what we need to do, that's the biggest source of stress. The fear of dying is not the biggest because when they enlist, they know that's uh, a possibility. But if you don't know what's going to happen, where it's going to happen, that uncertainty is, is unsettled. Second, is uh, we have cut off from our social uh, routines. You know, all of us, uh, routine uh, is something which are comfortable because it uh, creates different spaces. Uh, sleep time, personal time, work time. Now, all of those differences have collapsed. So a lot of organizations sometimes are having, uh, uh, you know, work from 8 in the morning to 10, 12. I mean, 12 hour work. And in the U.S., which is capitalist, they said beyond eight hours is not really productive. But here, because everybody is at home, I have access to something, we think we should do that. The third important thing is our own internal struggles. Many of us are very extremely harsh and critical with ourselves. Because all the time, we are just absorbing these things. You know, uh, that, you know, do this course, uh, read this book. Do this. Is it necessary? Why now? Why wasn't the pressure when we are regular college is on? Or school was on? So suddenly there's this whole pressure because you're at home, because you're not doing anything. So this pressure is something that's making a lot of people inadequate. I'm not reading enough. I'm not doing enough. Uh, other people are doing this. And constantly there is this thing, you know, the, sometimes these messages come, you know, that uh, if you're not able to do this during the lockdown, that means you are just sheer lazy. Now, all this kind of labeling, this kind of judgment is stupid. Nobody really knows what people are going through now. And therefore, we need to be very empathetic and help people deal with us. All of us have internal and external critics. And the external critics are pressures. You should be doing this, you should have done it. Uh, and the internal critic is our own uh, expectations from ourselves, which are often unrealistic, which are often possibly conditioned. It's okay, we'll all learn when we have to. Okay. Yes, it is good to have routine which will make sure that your body, uh, uh, the hormones are all in shape, so a little bit of exercise, walking around, connecting with people, chatting, talking, not just in terms of through WhatsApp. All of that will have positive impact. But please understand what we're doing to ourselves. One, in terms of feeling inadequate, uh, the, the systemic pressure which is there on people. You know, I as a teacher now, you know, I'm an old man in the sense that I have another year to go. So I can defy the system and say I will not do any webinars. I don't know if any of any teachers are in this group or if uh, you have any family people have webinars. Every day there are some five or ten webinars. And this has been since April. April, May, June. Are we saying that all people are going through uh, webinars have become all vidwans? And people like me uh, who have not gone to webinars, we are just backward. I don't know that there is any correlation. We all will learn and contribute when the uh, social, psychological, and mental conditioning is good. So if you want to stay composed, A, all of us need enough support systems. 
the support system must come from whether it is religious groups, friend groups, family groups. And we need to also pick up phones and talk to people, inquire. Do people need to talk? That is. And the other thing is that different kinds of people have different ways of responding. If you're somebody who is more of an extrovert, the lockdown can be much more higher pressure. Because a lot of your thinking and ideas comes by bouncing off talking to people. People who are introverts possibly may be better at handling because they are comfortable bouncing things off their head. But even for introver introverts, not having social connect can also be extremely problematic. So therefore, different people will be responding differently. And it's very difficult for us. And we need to have empathy because we don't really know what people are going through. Okay. I think, it, I don't know who said, an ancient philosopher said that everyone who comes in front of us is possibly going through 500 battles. We all have our demons, we all have our battles. So the best way is we need to give ourselves what I call tender loving care. Take care of yourself, stop being critical. And direct your energy to think of happy thoughts, positive possibilities. Also, shut yourself from too much of negative news. It's okay if you don't read the papers for some time. I haven't really read uh, papers in full for two months now. I, what I need to know, I'm getting. There are a lot of people who send me articles, this, that, so I'm getting that. Because for me, sometimes it's very tiring. I've stopped watching television news for the past two years. Do what helps you. Okay. So, we all need to figure out what will work for us. But the first thing is please have compassion, concern, respect for yourself. And for others who are going through this, you can't judge whether who's doing how well or uh, not well enough. There's no way of knowing. Yeah. I hope that answers. Yeah, so there are quite a few questions. So I'll just keep asking until you I tell know. me this stuff. Yeah. Okay. No, see, the thing is now, I don't know how long can uh, people can wait. So maybe now it is about 8 5. Mm -hmm. We'll go on till 8 15 because some of the questions just keep it. Uh, so that uh, we can start tomorrow or we will figure out what to do. All right. uh, because some of the questions which are relating to mental health, maybe we will take up on priority or whatever. I don't know how it works. But we will take another five questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next one is from Anam. Do you think the implementation of lockdown has failed every class of the society? Do you think the current crisis could have been prevented? See, in retrospect, see, at one time, people see, uh, in March, when the lockdown started, uh, I was very really optimistic that maybe by uh, me, uh, I think we'll be able to, uh, the curve will flatten. Okay? And I have obviously been wrong. Secondly, when you're doing lockdown in terms of, uh, should the lockdown be, see, these are all now academic questions. So the lockdown happened in February. Uh, what way could we have uh, a more nuanced lockdown? All that is something which doesn't help us. But I don't think all classes are affected by the lockdown the same way. All those who have secure incomes, their economic stress is, uh, I mean, you can't even compare. Okay? It's hardly there. Because I know a lot of people last two months have not been paid salaries small businesses, uh, medium enterprises, also they're the kind of hit they would take. So that, therefore, that is something which we can't imagine. So therefore, uh, we need to look at, so if you think, uh, if those of you think that lockdown is, uh, could have been managed better, what are your solutions? Please sit with people, think through, and then write to the chief minister, right to the home minister, right of the state, of the wherever. See what happens. Why can't we create uh, a lot of positive energy by statisticians? Some may be considered, but at least we are also uh, becoming, we are also saying that we will also contribute to ideas. Because sometimes maybe ideas don't come. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, the next one is from Parikshit. 
while we talk about developing a composed life don't we need a system to get ourselves in the right state of mind to consistently create rather than to just finish the avalanche of work that we are given not so see this i'm telling you for a lot of people who are working uh, uh from home the uh, where companies are demanding the stress is very high uh as i said because we now have uh, there are no boundaries okay earlier you the two hours for uh, one hour for time travel the breaks now it's continuous for the stress is too much uh so therefore we will need to figure out what kind of coping mechanism can we suggest in terms of uh, more breaks something but individually you need to figure out what is it that will help reduce your stress because some of us may not be having the bargaining capacity to talk to our employers to reduce pressure uh so it's uh, again as i said there are no easy answers for some of us it may be easy easy to negotiate with employers to make it uh you know uh less stressful etc so this one so therefore depending on the situation you have to look at it but more than the system we we'll also have to figure out how do we find uh, develop and strengthen our coping mechanism in this period of stress as i said for some of you work is a huge source of stress because the pressure of work is too much now i understand you have to figure that out but how much you can uh, get your employer to listen to you is something it's you know somebody like me has no ability to really influence yeah okay the next one is from sujith uh, the role of a citizen is to participate in the political process by asking critical questions however when the nationalist governments have stigmatized asking questions itself for maintaining the st uh, status quo then how are we to make questioning famous again so one is yes see i am also saying questioning is not just a government questioning ourselves can you also come up with solutions okay yes we see also if a lot more people say that we will not take this lying down and a lot of us begin question and along with question is why aren't we doing this see the kind of questions you ask will need to change one we need to keep asking critical questions when rights are being denied we need to ask critical questions when we think uh the uh, decisions are not being thought through but we also need to have solutions we also need to find see we also need to have what i said uh, pathways of connection okay it can't be only confrontation sometimes if it's just confrontation uh, then in that sense that you know the uh, system can feel pushed to the wall so while i confront am i also am i raising questions am i also providing solutions am i listening okay am i finding Uh, via media, what are the ways in which it can be done? Okay. Uh, there are some of these I, we will deal when we are talking about democracy and media and all that. But one, as I said, please also focus on solutions. Also, how do you create a culture of questioning, not just in political space? Political space is just a part of it. We don't have culture of questioning uh, among friends, in families, in schools, in colleges. So, if we can shape and influence that. that's a good beginning yeah next one is from ajay kumar why does our government take decisions to manage the economic slowdown by satisfying the industry by giving them relief in the tax wouldn't it would be wouldn't it be better if the government would had instructed the msmes to not to throw out their staff and workers well, see but who's going to pay their salaries because okay, msmes a lot of them are not able to pay salaries so what is the kind of assist help Uh, you know the poor people so what are the safety nets that's the first question second as i said what is happening is something which has uh, happened from 1991 where our emphasis has been on uh, economic growth so we are looking at 5% 8% economic growth according to certain calculations and therefore we see we must give incentive for people to produce okay so the uh, economic approach has definitely shifted a lot more elitist okay we are not correcting uh, in terms of where you know, we are not looking at where we should be uh, regulating better where we should have restrictions a lot of that so therefore over a period of time most of the institution have become very elitist when you go home please read uh, if you can find out about this judge of the supreme court justice krishna iyer 
1995 or 96, he said, he said, our judiciary is also becoming very elitist in the context of public and litigation. So this, it's a trend, it's not just now. Yeah. So for that, a lot of us will need to step up and say, uh, suggest what, so what kind of safety net should the government be providing? Come up with solutions which are economically viable. Yeah. Yeah, one is from Vandana. Uh, we are doing whatever we can, but the news around uh, makes us numb and affects us emotionally. So how do we deal with it? See, one is in terms of uh, how do we stop ourselves from internalizing what we're hearing? Okay? That's the first question. Easier said than done, but ask yourself this question. Every time I hear news, uh, am I also looking at and saying that what is it that I'm not hearing? I'm not hearing about the number of people who are recovering, okay? uh, the number of older people who recovered. Okay? We're only looking at cases of people who are either dying or who are unwell. Because we also need to know that there is in studies that are showing that maybe in some places things are becoming better. Second, if I'm using my imagination and if I'm uh, looking at something positive to look for. So it is a lot of things which I have to work with myself. And can I help, take the help of friends, counselors, uh, helplines to reorient myself? Sometimes I may need external help. Sometimes I may be able to find sense of myself, but please have support systems of people who are positive. You must have friends who are cheerful, positive, who can laugh, who can help you laugh at yourself. It's good that you balance both. Okay. That's important. Yeah. Uh, one from Ajay Kumar again. Uh, Why do we only talk about class and caste when we discuss marginal marginalized sections of the society, but not include disabled people? According to the UN, disabled people are the largest minority of the world. So can you please throw light on this? See, what has happened is if you look at discourse, uh, uh, ideological discourse, whether it's Marxist or uh, Fulay, Ambedkar, etc. They have chosen these categories. Some even say, why aren't we discussing gender in terms of violence and deprivation, whatever. Why aren't we looking at other genders other than just women? Why aren't we looking at, of course, people with disabilities are possibly being affected extremely severely. They've never really discussed that. So even in terms of our, uh, we don't really have uh, safeguards and protection uh, in fundamental rights, though it's a part of, supposed to be part of human rights, but people with disabilities have really not been considered as a part of mainstream, which is extremely unfortunate. Okay? So people with disabilities, gender, uh, ethnicity, race, all of these are something which are not, which don't feature in us. Okay. So we need to have discourses. So, as I said, if some of you can uh, write to people, see, there's through blogs, or forwards, can we focus on these issues? These are very important. I completely agree, it's something needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah, okay. so that was the last question. Yeah. So I think that's about 820 because uh, some of the things of uh, composing is something which I looked at. Just one last thing before I say. One of the things in terms of distractions. In the last maybe uh, five or ten years, uh, our attention spans have been coming down because we are allowing ourselves to be distracted. And therefore, is there going to be some part of the day you choose not to have your smartphone or look at something. Okay. How do you uh, get your mind to focus on what needs to be done? Okay. So when I say distraction, I can distract myself to by watching TV, uh, by gaming, by doing whatever. So if I know that is something which is making me sedentary and, act and inactive, is there certain things which I can try? Uh, uh, or which I can start doing, which can energize my spirit and body. That's something which is there. Some people say, 
okay, we may have houses which may not allow us to walk or may not use the space. So why don't we do what are called isometric, where you use your body uh, to send them. We need to be careful, you need to find out. Yeah, I was reading in this book, it says that isometric uh, exercises can sometimes have negative effect on women's bodies. So we need to understand a little more about our bodies and minds. So that's something. So the first thing is to figure out what is it that you're going to do and say, one hour I'm going to sit and read or write. A lot of us have stopped writing. Earlier, a lot of us used to write diaries. Uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago, a friend of mine sent me something by this philosopher, Jay Krishnamurti. He used to have a discipline. He said, whatever happened, whether you felt like writing or not, one hour in the morning we'll sit and write. If you have a problem, what do I write on? Start the stream of consciousness. Write whatever your mind tells you. Or you look at things and say, what are the kind of changes I want to see in the world? Or I want to see in myself? What is it that's bothering me? So writing, reading, exercise, talking to people, positive people, discussing issues, having diverse uh, opinions, all of that will help. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, we've gone beyond our time. Uh, and I don't know whether, uh, for those who are organizing, I cover what you wanted me to cover. Uh, if there are any questions which still come to you, maybe we'll start with that uh, tomorrow. And like today, we'll try and start exactly at 7. Yeah? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, guys, we have added a feedback form here. So if you could please fill that up for us. Abhishek, you want to add something? Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's a very quick form. Uh, all you have to do is just um, if you have any suggestions or any complaints or anything, uh, any suggestion on how we can make this more um, more useful for you in the coming lectures. This is only the first one, so we are still learning. Uh, and also, if you had any questions that could not be answered today, you can put it up there and we can, we'll see if uh, we can get Sir to answer them in the coming lectures. Thank okay. you very the, much. Just one thing. You know, a lot of us are expecting answers from outside. Yes, uh, teachers, bureaucrats, politicians have to give us answers. But it's also our own responsibility to see whether we can also uh, search and find answers and contribute to this generation of possibilities. I'm sure there are many ways in which uh, we can all come up with interesting ideas. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, so I think sir has left. Hello, is everybody still here? Are people still yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think uh, before we'll, uh, if you have some time, we could talk about how we can make this experience better. Or um, do you have, do you guys have any suggestions? In what you would like to be added in the coming lectures? Achha. Hello, Abhishek. Siddhi Hi, Siddhi Bhaiya. Hi. Hello. Achha, so there's just one small suggestion that I have. Uh, probably every lecture can start or...